morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm leading the session, I'm much interested, and I have an honor and privilege to say welcome to co organizer of the session, Minister Marek Kubarczyk, Secretary of State and Ministry of Infrastructure. It's also the, the pleasure to introduce Ambassador of Poland, permanent representative in, in UN, Krzysztof Szczelski. And also Mariusz Lewicki, permanent representative in UNESCO, as far as UNESCO is organizer, and we have the privilege to have a director of the Division of Water Science, who is the spiritus of moments of this session. Uh, Director Abu Amani. Uh, now I would like to ask Minister Marek Grubarczyk to say a few words for opening this session. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor, Professors, dear audience. I am very happy to start this uh, meeting, a very important, and uh, thank you very much for your idea to visible in the future and uh, hopefully we change the little bit uh, future of course uh, towards with the uh, United Nations so let me uh, official start <laughs> this process <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much of course the topic is very interesting transdisciplinary ecohydrology for an acceleration of uh, strategy development goals, so-called CG, CDG, methodology on scientists and pattern of implementation. Eco-hydrology is acknowledged by the United Nations and European Union as an associated discipline of the great importance for acceleration of achievement of sustainable development goals, CDG. The Anthropocene era which uh, we will live now is the time of rapid development of the social industry and the technology, but also the time for the integrated action of the global level. This is because we have uh, only one planet Earth and we have to make a joint effort to reserve degradation of the bio biosphere and the achieve desirable vision of the future. The strategy to achieve this has to contain uh, elements. Elimination of environment threat and enhance of resilience of natural system which are provides to ecosystem service for humanity. UN is important organization which uh, facilitate the cooperation of this positive path toward the future. As a mayor Trends is uh, humanity in 21st century in UN postulate an urgent acceleration of a CDG, where the water is to be considered a K drive and common denominator of a mutual process crucial for CDG. This session will define a new perspective how to use ecosystem properties as innovate, gain change in water and environment resource management. Ladies and gentlemen, let me give the floor a professor to bring the really very important speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to say that our session, Transdisciplinary Science, is somehow responding to increasing complexity of the relation uh, man and biosphere. Uh, and especially as we know the water is key driver of sustainability, we will focus on innovation, one of the key elements there, uh, game changing. And <coughs> why innovation? <coughs> this is starting from the Einstein statesman that people are tending to uh, try to solve the problem by the way of thinking which create the problem and this not never work. We have to change the way of thinking. And 
Ecohydrology is changing the game three dimensions. First, this is by integration, ecology, hydrology, and other related sciences, is highlighting life supporting processes. If we profoundly understand life supporting processes, we can develop advanced nature based solutions. In this conference, we could introduce this statement advanced, not only nature. Advanced, it means nature-based solutions which are supported by technology, molecular biology, phytotechnology. In this moment, efficiency increase, sometimes order of magnitude, <coughs> and costs are reduced, which is extremely important for us. And if we have a profound understanding light supporting process and advanced nature, we have enhanced sustainability potential. Water bioproductivity, biodiversity, biocomplexity, services for society, and resilience of the system. This is something which really is expressing our holistic view and encouraging to dialogue between different specialists, which is fundamental to solve. Why enhance this figure with showing demographic growth is showing why. If we on the earth with three billion people, conservation was stabilizing, and the idea was stabilizing the nature, and was great, was enough. But when already was more than five billion people, the restoration idea was expressing the, the, the concept of uh, reversing degradation. Now, this both are important, still in use, and has to be. However, we have seen more ambitious, and we enhance sustainability of the planet to really make harmony between men and environment. So what is the problem? Because as I said in the beginning, relation between men and water become more complex and more complex. And there are water management is mostly taking the water and you're releasing to water pollutants. And ecosystem are to great extent black box. And we have to open black box and start to interplay between ecosystem use as a tool. And how ecosystems are important, showing this recent map, showing that in this red area, ecosystems are responsible in 80% of stabilization and recirculation of water. So if, of course, there are some dark blue area when oceanic effects, uh, climate and precipitation is important. However, Poland, for example, has a 40% is dependent on ecosystem status and biomass, which is in the landscape. Next one. And however, how we should shape the landscape? Of course, we are going toward bioeconomy. Absolutely, it's important. However, what bioeconomy? On the right side, we see this semi-desert <laughs> industrial agriculture, which is degrading the different hydrological processes, which are affecting the amount of water, pattern of water, and quality of water. And left side is showing the positive situation when we have great landscape with high a buffering capacity, purification capacity, and uh, recirculation of nutrients capacity, efficient agriculture. Next one. <coughs> and of course, anticipatory model are fundamental to start to prepare this advanced nature based and systemic solution, which are integrate hydrology ecology. Next one. Uh, and this is already example. What means advanced nature based solution? This is sequential biofiltration system, which is reducing very efficient. On the left, you, you see input condensation of suspended matter output. And it's not wetland, not constructed wetland, but mimicking self-purification process of rivers, which we enhancing also by selecting bacteria, which are driving certain processes to make this more efficient. Next one. Next. And uh, this is combi combination hydroengineering and nature-based solution, hybrid system. On the beginning, we had uh, 165 milligrams suspended matter. After going through this, this hybrid system, we have uh, uh, 3.5, 20 times reduction. And costs are absolutely minimal. Next one. This was awarded best of the best life plus by European Commission, this solution. And finally, retention. We have to retain the water. How? We know that building reservoirs, blocking the river is not necessarily good, especially in small river. 
and on the right side you have a beautiful wide river with beavers, a project of the Lagos, typical hydrotechnical project blocking the river. Question was to ERC if such a construction will be generating toxic algal bloom. I said, if you construct like this, yes, but I, we propose make lateral reservoir, keeping beautiful wild rivers still, continue, and on the right side, the system which measuring the path of eco-hydrological processes, full pulses of concentration of phosphorus and environmental flow. And there are some moments when we have 800 micrograms of phosphorus, which generate toxic bloom, but some periods below 100. No, and system is getting only this clear water reservoir. It's never blooming. Next one. So now paradigm change. We're coming to uh, the methodology of science. This is on the left, the most recent publication, which, as you see, the mostly the sociocentric approach, the information management, and so on. But without consideration, this nature-based solution, which introduction I introduced just now, example, few we have a minute like this already, and we have to combine the sociocentric mechanistic. Yes, very important however, with evolutionary ecosystemic and with an advanced nature-based solution toward enhancement sustainability. Next one. And how to do it? If we want to really make holistic view, we must combine hydrochemistry, <coughs> microbiology, biotechnology, limnology, uh, hydrology, uh, satellite images, drones, and so on. And this only gives you all scope of possibilities and understanding the nature profound and harmonized our needs with the potential. Still keeping in mind some area to be conserved, conservation biology and so on. Finally, we need the transfer, methodology of science. Pure science, holistic model which I introduced, uh, testing the models in the catchment and developing this uh, innovative next one innovative solution and next transfer and testing in another place like in Ethiopia we have done in the framework Polish aid program where this uh, resulted in establishing the uh, African Center for Ecohydrology. <coughs> next. Uh, and let's come to summary. If we're starting from uh, information, understanding structures, states and processes, this is fundamental assessment. Next stage if we have assessed and we can generate knowledge, understanding patterns and processes. This is background to create advanced <coughs> nature-based solution. And wisdom, combining assessment with advanced nature, we can generate systemic solution for enhancement. Briefly, why ecohydrology is framework, framework in uh, UNESCO HP, water and water for all, becoming game changer. First, life supporting processes, explanation, Ecosystem for water, not only water for ecosystem, like was stated in some documents. New paradigm, open black box. Advanced nature-based solution. Enhancement idea of catchment sustainability, WBSR, but also this harmonization with society. This has to be by culture, education, and LPG, low policy and governance. Everything has to be translated to low policy and governance. And finally, foresight. We have to create desirable vision of the um, future based on science and harmonization of society priorities with enhanced potential of sustainability. And, and this already somehow started to appear in the strategic document, the uh, European Commission, uh, UNESCO, first of all, and the European Commission, Water for All already. And I would like to say that thanks to my colleagues from UNESCO, because all the inspiration and work was done thanks to such program, which is giving the opportunity to talk with people from different cultures, different countries, and is some, uh, something like Darwinian paradigm only when you're exposed to this. So, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. I encourage to sub submit the papers to special issue journal like hydrology, mm -hmm. uh, which to make this memorable this is, this, uh, side event really kind of permanent of science. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now
I think that we have a short, not too much time. Great yeah. trouble and money will be. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zalowski, and also uh, for the Secretary of State uh, for inviting UNESCO. Uh, we, are, we are very uh, excited, really, to uh, continue um, uh, promoting this uh, approach of ecology. We have been doing it almost since almost three decades now. Uh, just to show you that um, this is a visionary approach because now everybody is talking about NBS, uh, NBS Nature Based Solution. But within the UNESCO program, we have been already discussing that idea almost three decades before to really emphasize on the fact that we cannot expect managing sustainably water resources if you are not taking it in a global ecosystemic <coughs> approach. And uh, this is why uh, this idea of uh, eco-hydrology uh, was grounded within the different phases of IHP. Now uh, we are implementing the phase nine of IHP, which is uh, on science for a water security in a changing environment, uh, through an a holistic and transdisciplinary approach. This is why if you look at the IHP document, the five priorities identified by member states are not thematic oriented. They are clustered in order really to bring the different disciplines together to address what issues. And, and, and this is why uh, for us, we come out with this approach, learning from the work we did uh, on eco-hydrology. So looking at the system uh, through its ensemble is really the key. Um, professor has already identified, explained what is the uh, ecohydrology to you. Uh, what I want to, 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 to add is that we, within our program, we have what you call ecohydrology demonstrated sites. Those are sites where what he explained, the processes, understanding the science to uh, look at what are the interactions before being upscale is part of the work of those demonstration sites. And uh, we have been uh, really promoting it, asking member states to, uh, to apply for having some demo sites. Of course, we need to have researchers who are interested, university, uh, in order to, to follow those sites, uh, to understand what's going on. Uh, so in that regard, indeed, Things have evolved, and now we have. Let's, let's go to the another slide. The next one, because this one is. Uh, so we start having a community of ecohydrology, uh, what you call ecohydrology family. Uh, this is comprising chairs, centers of of UNESCO, uh, who are working on the idea, and we have them few of them here, and I know the majority of them are represented uh, in this table. Next slide. Uh, this is a methodology already explained by, by Professor Really, the holistic approach, and now putting the component of policy aspect. Because at the end of the day, we need to help in helping member states to take decisions uh, and uh, having appropriate policy. Next slide. Uh, so, next slide. There's a slide which is present exactly. So this slide is presenting you what are the current ecohydrology demonstration sites worldwide. We have 37 of them, and they are, as, as you can see, they're all over the world. And what we want at, through those ecohydrology demonstration sites is to um, continue improving our understanding of the, those different processes so that we can come out with uh, solution-oriented advice for really addressing the complex and related water challenges in a more evidence way. And as we all know, nature-based solution is the way forward and it has to be sustained with evidence also. And those are key objectives of those demonstration sites. This now is being known by member states within UNESCO. And what they say now, 
they don't, they want to have more than demonstration site. So they are supposed in UNESCO to look at other UNESCO sites, because as you know, within UNESCO we have the World Heritage Site, Natural Site, uh, we have the Geo Park. Uh, they want to ask to see to what extent some of those sites where we have water, mm -hmm. we can apply the concept of equadrovision. So we, have, we start from this program of UNESCO, looking at not only the demonstration site of ecology, but other UNESCO is inside in applying the principle of equality. And this is very, very interesting. We have already 10 biosphere reserves which are now embracing the equality principles. So our ambition is not to have any more demonstration site. We want to have another level. But probably by the end of IHP 9, we can reach so that we can have another level so that we can have not only not eco hydrology demonstration site, but eco hydrology recognized UNESCO site. Because for the time being, the demonstration sites are <coughs> research sites, but we want them to be developmental sites. So I think it will take some time, but I think we we are on the right we are on the right track. So uh, my message now is that I'm calling upon all of you, those who are interested really to apply or to um, better develop within the landscape, because it depends on the situation also the landscape. The principle of ecology, please, you can apply, because every year you can submit application by, <coughs> by June, you can send application, and then uh, you have until uh, August, we are receiving application, and then in December we are looking at the receive application so that we can identify what are those potential demonstration sites you can put in the network. And also, I'm encouraging you also to establish chairs within universities to promote this idea, and also centers uh, on ecohydrology, because we want to create a movement because we cannot no longer continue business as usual when it comes to water issue. NPS is the way forward. And we cannot do properly NPS if you are not feeding it with evidence. Because we need to have major, many evidence based on landscape. And this is very, very important. So thank you very much for all the support. Thank you, Director Abu Amani, for the impressive speech. And uh, important game changer in, for development in hydrology and advanced nature-based solution is Water for All, big, big mega program of European Commission. And we have a two representatives of this program, coordinator of the program, Marianne Bloom, uh, yes, and Antonio Laporta, who is uh, Chief of International Cooperation, uh, PILAR. So, Rihanna, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Messias. Just, uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. I'm the coordinator of this uh, partnership and I've been working for the French National Research Agency. Uh, so, thank you very much uh, to Poland and the UNESCO for organizing this side event on this important topic that is not new, <coughs> absolutely not new, uh, but there are so many opportunities and needs to support research knowledge uh, to protect ecosystem and to, uh, to, to have a society base based also on uh, natural based solutions. So thank you. I will leave the floor directly to Antonio, who is responsible for international activities to present uh, our partnerships. Thank you, Monsieur. Thank you, Marianne. Well, uh, first slide, please. Well, uh, we have a, a vision. Uh, we developed the vision during the development of our proposal, the Water for All Partnership. And uh, we plan to uh, take actions toward a, a smart, water smart society. And water smart society in our uh, dictionary means uh, that we would like to achieve a society which is inclusive, uh, in which water protections involve uh, everyone. It's meant to uh, cover everyone, citizens, youth, politicians, land managers, scientists, uh, private companies as well. 
And uh, we mean also uh, Waters Bound Society as one, the one that provides a fair, sustainable use of fresh water um, resources, being the, the drinking water, biodiversity, irrigation, water for agriculture, energy industry, with key, clear, balanced, comprehensive, accessible, knowledge-based measures. And we also mean that uh, the society we are aiming at is an innovative society in which uh, that which w that wants to accelerate the changes and reach local, national, international goals. Next, please. Uh, why it is need to take actions? Uh, this is all those uh, points are uh, I suppose they are not new, uh, not new for uh, all of you. Uh, first of all, there is a, a sharp decrease of uh, available annual freshwater resources per inhabitant, uh, and this happens. Uh, in different ways uh, around the world, but at least in, uh, in Europe, for what regards the area in which we are uh, operative, uh, um, there is a very huge decrease in, uh, in availability. Um, you can see, for example, that in Spain, the, the decrease of uh, availability of water, fresh water, is uh, it's like 65%, in Malta is 54 In the Mediterranean, it's a quite, uh, it's a quite common uh, feature. Uh, also, it is very well known that, uh, according to the report of the IPCC, the last one, uh, water-related disasters, uh, hydroclimatical uh, extreme events are increasing in frequency and in intensity. <coughs> and this is uh, much likely due to the climate change, and this, but it is also related to the uh, very bad land use uh, and uh, management of water that we uh, do in, into our countries. Uh, one of the major uh, legislative tools that are available in Europe is the Water Fair Directive. Uh, that is uh, nowadays a little bit uh, aged because it, it started, uh, became operational in 2000, uh, so it is more than 20 years old. Uh, that was aiming at, at, at obtaining a good ecological status for uh, the rivers in Europe, and but only six uh, or forty percent of those uh, rivers have achieved this good ecological status, and uh, thirty percent of the uh, EU groundwater still is not achieving the good ecological status. So there is a, a strong need to accelerate the efficiency of the measures that have been uh, put in place and the new ones that have been uh, developing during this year. Uh, and we uh, also, for doing this, we must improve, uh, boost the impact of research projects. Because the Commission, the European Commission, has been uh, investing a lot into research projects, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we are still lagging uh, quite, quite a lot behind the uh, goals that we uh, set for ourselves. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, that's why the Commission, the European Commission, uh, launched uh, the idea of a partnership on, uh, in, in originally in Europe, but with an open eye to involving uh, as much as we can other countries around the world. Uh, the Commission selected uh, 49 priorities uh, for the European society, and that's why we in Water for All are not alone. Uh, the, uh, there are plans for funding uh, 49 uh, partnerships, uh, and the water uh, one, the water for all, is one of these, and is uh, a measure of what, uh, how much the Commission, the European Commission, uh, considering this uh, topic, the water, is a, 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 to be important, is the fact that the water uh, for all partnership is, has been one of the first few launches. So we are uh, exp experimenting this concept of uh, the partnership. And this uh, has uh, some good um, uh, eff uh, to say effects, but also <laughs> some uh, cons, because we are, uh, to say, uh, tra tracing the street, and it, uh, and it is not so, so easy for both of us or the condition to manage this kind of uh, partner uh, partnership. Why? Because, for, for example, those kind of partnerships are very large. Water for All is made by 80 partners, um, which is a huge number, uh, just 
I don't want to be into the shows of uh, Young. <laughs> Let us to manage this, uh, this large number of partners. Uh, 34 of which are research funding agency ministries, most likely. Uh, 18 are research organizations, uh, economic actors, regional, national, international networks, even some uh, local or regional administrations. So 31 countries are represented into the uh, Water for All partnership, uh, eight of which are not, uh, not European. Uh, if you look into the map in the lower left uh, corner, you can see that uh, Brazil is a part of the, of the partnership together with uh, South Africa, uh, UK, uh, Moldova, uh, Turkey, and others. Uh, this uh, is a, uh, a new approach uh, for the Commission. In, in, w in, uh, in which sense? First of all, because uh, this partnership, Water for All and the other partnerships, are uh, intergovernmental um, initiatives. So the government that are interested in this uh, exercise gather together, put their own funds uh, in the common basket, uh, and the Commission uh, co-founds them, putting uh, one third on top of uh, that. Uh, so that is a, a new way of supporting research, uh, which is uh, or oriented at uh, satisfying the, the, uh, the goals that the governments uh, uh, participating in the initiative are, um, have, uh, <coughs> uh, have in mind. Uh, we, uh, our, our uh, how to say, our um, uh, polar, uh, our North Star is the, uh, the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda. Uh, this uh, agenda took uh, uh, quite a, a long time, two, two years more or less, uh, to be developed, starting, yeah, starting from uh, the uh, assessment of uh, existing Strategic Research Agenda. We have seven. Uh, big teams, uh, uh, water for circular economy, uh, water for ecosystem biodiversity, water, uh, water for the sustainable water management, water and health, water infrastructures, and two uh, cross-cutting uh, uh, initiatives, uh, the international cooperation and the governance. Into the red square, uh, you can see the topics, the sub-teams that uh, are under the point number two, which is water for ecosystem biodiversity, which is the one that is of interest for today. Uh, next, please. Uh, we can skip it. I already been touched. <laughs> okay. Uh, where we are now? Uh, we have launched one, uh, the first uh, the first uh, uh, transnational call that uh, is on the top was on the ta on the topic of management of water resources, resilience, adaptation, and mitigation <coughs> of extremes. And uh, uh, this has been closed. It is uh, the projects are close to uh, to start uh, to let's say to start let's say in the in the next future. In September this year, we'll be launching this, uh, uh, the second call will be launched. It is uh, on the topics that is of interest today. It is on ecosystem services, integration of ecosystem services into the management of water resources, of the water resources in the, cost of, in the context of a global change. So we will look at the resilience, mitigation, and adaptation of aquatic ecosystem and ecosystem services. Uh, this will be open in uh, September. Um, we have, uh, of course, we plan to uh, respond to SDG 6, uh, which is the main uh, argument of our, our uh, partnership, but of course other water related SDGs will be our, uh, our uh, interest, of our, uh, of our interest. It is important to say the overall budget that is uh, moved by this Water for All initiative is a little bit less than half a billion euros, which for Europe is a huge quantity. Um, we plan to launch uh, international cooperation for science uh, behind, behind frontiers to be involved very much into uh, water diplomacy and we are already working on this uh, in, the, in this, direc this direction and we plan to involve all actors and we also plan to um, for, uh, to push open science and open open data approach next please uh, that's all. Uh, you can contact uh, us uh, at those uh, at, at the email and the, the, on the website. <laughs> on the website, you can <coughs> have access to the ZRIA so that you can have an idea of the topics that will be somehow explored during the, the next calls, uh, st uh, starting from the one that will be launched in September. And you will see also how your country, if you're not yet in, uh, involved into the water for all, can be involved. Uh, there are different options. Uh, not, not all of them are, at, let's say, expensive. So there is the possibility 
for uh, any country to uh, join us as, as observers for the first part in order to see how it, it works, to be involved on the actions that they, uh, in which they, uh, this country can be interested. We uh, are uh, very open to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Found explanation, and I think that such holistic approach, uh, which is developed in the uh, framework intergovernmental hydrological program and water for all, need involvement of society, and that's why we have a lecture about the culture as an element which is create changing the mind of society toward acceptation of this holistic view and transdisciplinary science and advanced nature-based solution. Professor Karl Wald, Matthias Wald Vanson. University. Thank you very much, Maciej, ladies and gentlemen. Wilderness, next slide. Beauty, dynamics, peace, harmony, how long? While we are sitting and talking here, the Itrovia on the Paraguay River is being built, which will destroy about 50% of the Pantanal, world's largest wetlands. The war in Ukraine continues with severe damages for humans and for the environment. More and more dams are built worldwide, bringing death by a thousand cuts to the rivers. Global socio-environmental <coughs> socio injustice is going on. Our daily business Policies and management deliberately takes into account collateral damages of biological diversity and ecosystem functions. Take the large bodied fish of the northern hemisphere alone. They are down to 5% compared to 1970, and in 1970, the sturgeon, for example, in Europe was almost extinct. They cannot beg for pity, they cannot ask us to stop this. So, we have both in biodiversity and in cultural diversity certain species traits, certain elements that are lethal, that are not compatible with our way how to manage aquatic ecosystems. So uh, biological species that are migratory, large-bodied, attractive for hunting or sensitive or have large territories, they are not compatible. In cultural Exp expressions, if dependency on nature, low economic return, low competitivity, sensitivity against Western nation, or a long time to learn these cultural practices is also not compatible with our way how to manage aquatic ecosystems in continental waters worldwide. Next. So with the river culture concept, we are trying to overcome this. We do study biological species traits and cultural traits in parallel, or better, in synergy. We do not separate between these anymore. Reset values on the river ecosystem management is, I think, the first step that we have to go away from an asset-oriented management just for fresh water, drinking water, or for hydropower, or for navigation. Consider nature consider environmental justice with non-human beings. Adapt human activities to the rhythm of the river. Humanity has come from river floodplain areas. Agriculture has been invented in floodplains. And uh, there are many people in the world that can show us how this is still possible. So the next step is to see what of these, which of these uh, traditional ecological knowledge and these practices can be taken over or take, can be transformed for our modern river management. I'm not romantic, I'm not saying that we can copy paste things from the past. Very often they are not sustainable or not uh, uh, compatible with uh, social justice, for example. Another, so please go back with the slide. Another point are the biotic strategies. So what I call the stratagome is the entirety of the different adaptation strategies that we find about living beings. For example, how ants adapt to floods. They can teach us, for example, in the Loire we have floods, uh, we have ants that 
just uh, built under water, uh, waterproof houses that can be flooded. And lastly, a political statement that we need to make the hydrological catchment, the water basin that unites all the water falling into an, uh, fr finally assembling into one river, the unit for territorial management. In the European Framework Directive, we have already started to do so with the river basin management plans, but we have to go farther than this, and we have to create justice between those that are living upstream and downstream, and we have to create justice between the humans and the non-human beings. Next, please. So I asked people, starting in a conference in Wuhan 2018, can we live in peace, or peace again, with our rivers and how? And 125 authors from 24 countries have answered and delivered 28 biocultural case studies of rivers worldwide, which you can <coughs> uh, read yourself in this book, River Culture, which just has been issued at UNESCO Publishing. Next, please. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you can flash this and you can, uh, as I said, download the entire book. It is for free. It's still not printed, but we hope we will find a sponsor for printing soon. Next. <coughs> so the bottom line message of this book is if we take the ups and downs here in this graph, in the vertical axis and the time axis to the right, in our traditional societies we have ups and downs, we have uh, drawbacks by uh, uh, floods and so on, but uh, the nature was also able to recover. In the industrial times, the rivers are mostly on a downward movement, but some of these uh, societies are making a turning point, a catharsis. But do we need a catastrophe to reach these uh, turning points, as it was the case for the Rhine River with the Sandos accident, the chemical spill that killed my, most of the fish in the Rhine. Only after this event and several flood catastrophes, cooperation on the Rhine between the different member states were really active before they just existed on paper. Next. So my approach tries to bring this more into a, a softer version. We do not have to wait for a catastrophe. We have to analyze in detail the problem spheres of the biophysical problem like water pollution. We have to know the social sphere. What is the decision-taking system in the respective place, in the respective society and culture? The problem sphere is very similar all over the world. Take just plastic mm -hmm. pollution in rivers or water pollution. But the social sphere is different. That is what this book here is good for, that we have an overview of who is dealing what, how. And finally, if we can overlay these two, we will find a solution sphere for these. I give you four short examples. Projeto Manuel Zao in Brazil, Belo Horizonte. People wanted to stop waterborne diseases. The infant mortality was just too high. So starting with medical doctors, academics, and the social movement, and finally the government took over. But we were in a time of the Rio 1992 conference, and the political background was very favorable. In India, uh, people are active in community-based conservation initiatives to reduce the clogging of the rivers by plastic and by invasive plants. In Zurich, it was an uh, economical argument it is too expensive to treat rainwater in wastewater treatment plants. So dividing wastewater and rainwater was a good idea, enabling the daylighting of, nine, of 62 kilometers of streams in the city that are wet burned and are now back again. And finally, in the Allier River in France, 25 year long dialogue between an NGO and uh, <coughs> the uh, energy provider in France resulted in that the dam was lowered by 70% and is still producing 80% of the energy, but it can be completely lifted when the salmon are migrating and this is helping the last populations of the salmon to survive. And the recipes for success, well, we are working on this in detail. Here's just a short list. Cultural connectivity is key. It is important that the people are understanding what we are doing. We need a match between bottom-up movement, grassroots NGOs, and top-down by the governments, and perseverance, repetitive, reiterative processes are uh, uh, important 
and we need charismatic leaders. Next. So if we see uh, what <coughs> Maciej and I have uh, composed, uh, written together for the synergies between the eco-hydrology and the river culture approaches, we are very well aligned. We have many, many points in common. I will not go through all of them, but the next uh, is it's very important that the advanced, not enhanced, advanced nature-based solutions, these are the, the ecosystem bionics I'm, I'm talking about, learn from nature and integrate it in a smart way. Next. So let us make eco-hydrology and river culture game changers from the sociocentric to the evolutionary ecosystemic. We have a, an awareness crisis. People are just letting go. Business as usual is continuing. So we have to support, restore and or event human nature relationships. The water supply crisis. We really are running short in water in the landscape at the global scale. So we need to enhance natural water storage in riparian uh, wetlands and forests instead of damming rivers. And the biocultural meltdown, it's not only about biodiversity, it's not only about cultural diversity, both together need healthy socio-ecosystems and justice. And the flood damages and heat waves in cities require that we think completely anew about this, not only considering cutting the crest of it, but really using the water for storage in natural floodplains and uh, human river encounter sites, which are uh, helping to get into contact with the river, especially for urbanites. And the water pollution there, uh, Maciej has already said it all, eco enhancement of natural processes and recreation of floodplains. <coughs> Next. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Professor Luis Ticharo, Vice Chairman, uh, Eco Hydrology Water Quality in IHP 9, to lead the panel discussion. And we'll start maybe from, from the left, Stefano Fancy, and so on. Yeah? Please, Luis, take care of that. Everybody. Except Professor Yaya. Stefano. Good morning, everybody. So we will start for our presentation. So we're going to start for our panel session. From these presentations, we are able to see how ecodrology can address many problems regarding water issues, uh, about <coughs> improving ecosystem services, biodiversity, water quality, even culture and education, as was just uh, presented. So uh, now we are going to check a little bit what are the advan ad advantages and the limitations that ecodrology is facing. And for that, we have only one question for the panelists. And this, how ecodrology implementation can act as a game changer for water management in order to accelerate the achievement of sustainable development goals and also which, if any, bottlenecks are limiting such implementation. So this is, the, let's say, the, the key uh, question for, for all of you. And I'm very happy to count with Dr. Stefano Fazzi, uh, Mr. John Rowan, Ms. Donga Ko from uh, Korea, Ms. Katarzyna Izidorsi from Poland, Mr. Przemek Gruszewski from Poland too, and Mr. Uh, John Bulek from Bahamas and representing uh, Latin America. And Miguel, you are, I'm Miguel Dori. Okay, I'm sorry, Miguel. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't say. Okay, so uh, we have three, five minutes each. So it's a limited question, time, time. So uh, please keep the time and thank you. We can start by Stefan. Okay, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the Polish government and the UNESCO for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here today. Okay, in the framework of UNESCO HP Hydrology Program, and uh, thanks to a very tight uh, scientific collaboration between uh, the Polish Academy of Science and the National Research Council, we have been applying holistic approach to integrate knowledge and find new solutions for improving water quality, enhancing natural-based solutions. In particular, we study carbon and nitrogen cycling uh, we, uh, yeah, uh, in aquatic environment, and this know-how is then translated uh, in natural-based solutions, such as uh, the constructed wetlands and uh, sequential barriers. We learn from natural environment, 
as a, for example, from our intermediate uh, Mediterranean rivers, that due to the summer drought get disconnected is in, the, in the isolated pools. In these pools, we study how the water retention time affects the microbial metabolism, the reactivity of the biofilms, and the dynamic of the greenhouse gases. We try to understand how the mm, system functions and how we can force microbes to perform certain processes that can help us to improve water quality. In doing this, uh, we apply advanced molecular tools, such as DNA sequencing, uh, that has, uh, this, uh, uh, to assess uh, the functional potentiality of the autochthonous communities. Environmental DNA, what is now called eDNA, could become not only an important instrument for establishing a new, new bioindicators of water quality, but, mo but more importantly, uh, can become functional indicators. In synthesis, genomics can help us to understand the functional characteristic of the system. We also advance natural-based solution by studying new natural materials that can help us in purifying waters and recover uh, and reuse nutrients, such as phosphorus, that is becoming a critical raw material. We combine natural-based solution with iron-coated biochar or soil phosphorus, and this material can then be used as soil fertilizer. At the same time, we improve water quality and increase the carry capacity of the system. To conclude, another important uh, aspect is related to capacity building. In addition to UNESCO training on, in equidrology, we are all involved uh, in, the, in the Erasmus Mundus Master uh, in uh, Applied Equidrology, led by Professor Cicero. But more importantly, we are thinking to build up, uh, to establish an equidrology lab network among all the UNESCO equidrology demo sites in order to share technique and samples and apply the same approach at uh, the old demo site. This will certainly help uh, in integrated knowledge and increase the technical capacity of the stakeholders and the scientific community that implement activities in the demo sites, uh, providing an important background for the enhancement of natural based solution under different geographical, socioeconomic and cultural contexts. Thank you very much. Can we pass now to John, please? Thank you, Chair, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation to, to participate in these important procedures, the proceedings. My name is John Rowan. I'm a professor and director of the UNESCO Centre for Water Law Policy and Science, which is based in the University of Dundee in Scotland. We were established as a Category 2 water centre by UNESCO's IHP programme in 2008 with a mandate to pursue interdisciplinary approaches spanning legal policy and science activities promoting development through good water governance. So I feel that's a very appropriate um, mandate for today's proceedings and I'm honoured to be with you today. So we work across mul multiple scales and varied ecosystems and climatic zones from deglaciating montane environments in the Andes and Himalayas to tropical lowlands including parts of the Zambezi Basin and across peninsular India and Bangladesh. Uh, we also undertake considerable eco-hydrological research and engagement in the UK, particularly in Scotland where there are three IHP HELP basins. And you may remember colleagues that HELP is the program, a flagship program of UNESCO which is based on hydrology, environment, life and policy. It's a, a program with over 90 basins worldwide not all of which are, are particularly dynamic at the moment, but we happen to have three um, marked on this small map, um, on the D, the Dawn and the Tweed. All have source to sea hydrometric networks, extensive stakeholder engagement with local landowners, agricultural fisheries, forestry and industrial users like the Scottish whisky industry, along with environment and conservation agencies, both regulatory and NGOs. All of these systems are famous Atlantic salmon rivers, with associated keystone aquatic species such as otters, lampreys and freshwater pearl mussels. So I'm going to restrict my remarks today to ongoing work that's in the Edelston Water, which is a subcatchment of the Tweed Basin. It's approximately 70 kilometres square and it spans the, the border country between southern Scotland and northern England. 
and I've got a real pleasure to announce today that the Edelston Water was confirmed as the latest eco UNESCO Eco Hydrology Demonstration Site. We've already heard from our distinguished speakers how these sites embrace strategies to achieve sustainability of ecosystems closely related to water and to improve IWRM through these interesting new acronyms around water, biodiversity, uh, ecosystem services, resilience, culture and education. And we very much um, welcome this, this conceptual evolution and particularly uh, the idea around looking at enhancement and going beyond, which is incredibly exciting as a new paradigm. So we believe that the ongoing action-based research in the Edelston Water provides valuable perspectives and transferability of approach to sustainable and climate resilient water resources. It's an example of multi-agency and stakeholder collaboration focused particularly on reducing flood risk and restoring eco-hydrology for the socio-economic <coughs> and cultural benefit of local communities and wildlife and providing resilience against ongoing climate change. The particular driver for this uh, investment in this extended science program was that in Scotland there was the establishment of the Flood Risk Management Act of 2009, which created a legally binding requirement for government to generate new evidence upon which to base policy and to implement law and to bring forward regulation. So it's incredibly important to see this interface and this nexus between um, political and policy aspiration and the delivery of, of science and in this case to maximize the benefits of nature-based solutions towards catchment and societal well-being particularly around the concept of natural flood management so in the past 14 years we've developed a world-class hydrometric network of weather station stream gauges aquifer behavioral characterization water quality and parallel with ecological social survey importantly and interestingly economic evaluation and lots of stakeholder engagement to try and bring the multiple publics on site to the project. So since the baseline study was established, the researchers sought to evaluate the performance of multiple nature-based interventions within the catchment, seeking to restore ecological function and deliver benefits, particularly around natural flood management. So there's been the creation of retention ponds, there's been the reinstating of meanders in the main channel, and placement of leaky woody dams, upslope and valley bottom afforestation and appropriate levels of ecosystem service mapping along with it to understand the changes that are happening within the system. Much of this has been led by local communities, um, a very engaged and effective community called the Tweed Forum. And I was very interested to hear the professor's um, commentary about the importance of having continuity, to have inspiring leadership and to have persistence in terms of trying to deliver these long-term, multi-generational aspirational programs. And I think this has been a, a case in point here, and we also acknowledge and welcome the ongoing research and support and funding support we've had from the Scottish, the UK, and, and European uh, funding mechanisms. So just to say that we can now see with the establishment of this detailed program that the benefits of natural flood management can be realized by these multiple interventions, for example, we've planted over 300,000 native trees. We can see profound changes in the soil infiltration characteristics, all of which is leading to very diverse changes in connectivity and the benefits of slowing the flow and biodiversity recovery. So, so I, in fact, thank you, Chair. Apologies. So I just wanted to uh, formally acknowledge here in the UN headquarters that the success is about leadership and, and to particularly um, acknowledge Mr. Luke Cummings of the Tweed Forum, Chris Bray and Andrew Black of the UNESCO Water Centre for the work that's ongoing and we'll move beyond that chair. Thank you very much. So we we'll now move to Ms. Bonga Co from the uh, uh, National Committee of Republic, uh, National HP uh, Committee of Republic of Korea, please. Sure. Can you present yourself, please? Yeah. Um, Your Excellency, um, your distinguished guest, thank you very much for inviting me here, and I'm very honored to be part of this session with the, this significant um, agenda. I'm Dunga Ko um, from Korean National Comedy of the IHP, UNESCO IHP. Within this given time, this is not my presentation, but maybe I could just skip that one. <laughs> Within this given time, um, i like to share a um, case in Korea that has proved the advantages of um, the eco-hydrological um, holistic approach in when, when playing the restoration of the river basin. So 
it's case of it's, it isn't either, but <laughs> yeah. But it's just like one slide, so I don't I don't need to use it. But yeah, so it's a case from Ulsan, a million population city designated as uh, industry and manufacturing um, cluster since 1962. And the city has grown rapidly along with the Korean economic boom, as you know already. Um, within this time, sorry, so, um, the city has been growing rapidly, as I said, and along with the Korean economic boom and with the human-centered development. Consequently, the river crossing across the city has been significantly contaminated, and which measured to be 11.3 billion in 1996, which indicates the water quality is very poor and uh, difficult for underwater lives to live alone. Also, from human perspective, there were non-ecosystem services provided to the citizens. And at this point, the river was infamously called Death River. In the early 2000s, the city realized the needs for the change, and the holistic approach has been implemented. And therefore, Ulsan declared that they, they will restore the basin not only for water quality, but also thinking about the biodiversity, ecosystem service, and as well as the resilience of the city and which called WBSR, as Professor Zalewski said. Nowadays, um, <coughs> the water quality has significantly changed. So BOD now <coughs> changed from 11 to a 1.2, measured in a 2016. And not only the water quality, as following the improvement of the water quality, uh, there was a return from the various underwater species, such as salmon. So it has been counted less than five in 2003, <coughs> but nowadays it's 1800 in coming in the same river. Also, the life on the uh, on the on the above the land come back to the basin, and now <coughs> 20,000 um, water birds, including um, endangered species, are nesting and resting at the basin. It is important to note that still, <coughs> Ulsan city is an industrial city, and they are also population is growing slowly but steadily. However, implementing the eco-hydrology on the basin at the early stage of the planning has changed, um, achieved a sustainable and resilient development. So which benefits not only the mankind and also the biodiversity. Further, improved water quality has led the city government to be able to provide <coughs> water ledgers. So there's some like swimming laces, races and the eco-tour bird watching activities to the citizens, which ultimately raised the um, environmental awareness and the educational perspective, as the professor said. So to sum up, a holistic approach, overarching WBSR, is proven to be effective for the sustainable development, as you see from the Ulsan case, and continue to be influential in cultural education aspect as well. So here, our IHP National Committee um, is determined to support this approach and dissemination of the WBSR practice um, from Korean cities by suggesting those basins to be part of UNESCO recognized eco hydrology site. Thank you. Thank you. So now we move to Latin America, to Mr. Miguel Doria, regional hydrologist for. Uh, to UNESCO HP, and uh, so we give her three minutes, Miguel. So, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation also to be part of this panel. Uh, well, as uh, we all know, Latin America and the Caribbean is home to a very large diversity in hydrological terms. It has the world's widest basin, the Amazon, the widest estuary, um, in La Plata, uh, the widest uh, wetland, Pantanal, 95% of the world glaciers in the Andes, the, also the driest non-polar desert in Atacama, uh, Guarani, the, so also the largest uh, aquifers and so on and so forth, but it's also threatened by a uh, whole diversity of challenges and changes, uh, like climate change, droughts affecting many parts of the region right now, 
um, urbanization, land use change, and uh, all this, of course, puts enormous pressures not only on ecosystems but also on our societies. And um, and I think that the the theme of um, of this conference, the World Water Day this year, is rating and change, um, has a lot a lot also to do with this session. So it's uh, when we speak about this rating change, we speak about this rating solutions. And uh, we have very present that ecohydrology is one of the, the solutions that um, that we can use to to, to well, achieve the future we want in Agenda 2030, and to and for that we need to accelerate it as well. So we are very happy on one hand to report that uh, ecohydrology in luck, um, boy, it's accelerating in terms of, uh, for instance, the most recent sites. Uh, it uh, grew, grew exponentially in the last five years. It passed from three to nine. We need, uh, well, 81 <laughs> probably in the next five years so to, to follow the track. Um, but, and here it's also working with other parts of UNESCO uh, since, well, as the map program, uh, with the World Heritage, we now have a site in Galapagos. Um, also with the ancestral hydro technologies. And uh, just to remind that one month ago we had actually a conference on this topic, uh, Latin America is also home to a very large diversity um, in cultural terms. And um, all this is due, of course, to, uh, I think, a wonderful team of experts from the countries in the region. Uh, we have uh, well, Marcelo Gabin, Marco Balassi, and Chavez, and of course, John Bollock, that is the current coordinator, and uh, whom uh, will take uh, the word from here. So, John, please. Mm -hmm. From Baham, sorry. I think we will <laughs> jump with. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, excellencies and guests. And uh, I think just to reiterate what has been said uh, from Latin America and the Caribbean, it's a very interesting blend of uh, small island states and also continental countries. And uh, what I really want to state here is I think through conversation, we can learn so much more. Um, I'm a civil engineer, I come from an engineering background, so typically we build and we're taught to build against what is natural. But uh, through hydrology, the cultural aspect and the nature-based solutions are much more beneficial to us all. Climate change has brought us all together and uh, continues to bring us all together. So this, uh, it, it, it has encouraged our discussions and our appreciation for a cultural approach and not typical, but which has been the, the approach, the holistic approach uh, to solutions that we all require for flooding drought uh, rather than just building many more structures. And I uh, want to encourage the, you know, um, I'm hoping that someday we will meet, meet the 81, and um, I think we are growing in terms of eco-hydrology sites. Uh, speaking from Latin America and the Caribbean, it's not just Latin America and the Caribbean. I think we can learn from each other. We learn from all aspects. Uh, water is that binding thread that brings us all together. And I just want to um, highlight uh, two new sites in Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, the Quebradas Park site in Chile and the Rio Santo Antonio site in Brazil. So we continue to move forth and I think uh, through conversation, through dialogue, uh, open dialogue with the other regions, uh, we can uh, return to our cultural aspects of control of water. And not really control of water because we really can't control the water, but working together with water. So thank you. Now well, let's move to the management, to Mr. Przemek Buszeki, uh, Director of the Department of Water and Environment Management, State Holding Polish Waters for St. Paul. Good morning everyone, thank you for the question. I know we are running off time, so I'm, I'll do my best to answer briefly. Um, from a perspective of a competent authority, competent in uh, uh, water management sector. Uh, I'd say there are three difficulties to implement uh, scientific um, projects uh, or more demanding projects in, in, uh, in, in water management. Now, the first is that, that uh, the public administration is sectoral, so we act in our own 
given fields uh, under regulations that must be followed. Uh, so I would say sometimes we, we got stuck in trenches and we, uh, we keep the, the, the place where, where we are. On the other hand, the scientific world may be uh, pretty uh, divided. So sometimes there are conflicts, different opinions, different visions, even jealousy. Uh, and uh, governmental perspective uh, might be uh, difficult to, underst to, to understand because it imposes its own limitations. So uh, we should be more open, more, more uh, open-minded uh, to think wider, uh, to be to be ready for for those uh, more sophisticated projects uh, and scenarios. Uh, because our aim, main aim, the main purpose is to uh, deliver. Uh, water, water in uh, proper quality and quantity to all reasonable needs. Thank you. Now, last but not the least, of course, we are moving to Ms. Katarzyna Zidorski. This is the new director of the Mishku Center in Poland. So please for the job. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present some results from Pidica River Basin. This is uh, research which was done in European Regional Center for Ecohydrology with strong cooperation with Polish waters. Uh, Pidica River Basin, as you can see from the photos, this is typical lowland uh, catchment used mainly for agriculture. This generates the problem of nutrient pollution from non point sources and as, as consequence, eutrophication of surface water, especially the occurrence of toxic cyanobacteria blooms in reservoirs. The measures such as enhanced buffer zone and sequential systems were answers to our needs. This advanced nature-based solution, due to the multifunctionality, contribute to water purification and retention, increase biodiversity through creation of new habitats, and provide a service to society. Next, please. But it's important to remember that advanced NPS are targeted measures, meaning that they are dedicated to the specific problem and they need to be located in the optimal place at the river basin scale. And for this reason, we have used mathematical modeling. By applying the models at a catchment scale, we can first assess the threats and risk and then translate this information into the identification of priority critical area and choose the right solution, for example, advanced nature-based solution or some kinds of hybrid solution. And the next, as postulate the ecohydrology ecosystem can be used as a tool for water management. The question is how we can reconnect those bow lakes or restore regulated rivers for enhancement ecosystem resilience. The answer of this question is the further developing of a defense nature based solution because we need to fully understand the ecohydrological process in this ecosystem in order to enhance them. The answer for this question is the topic is the task for researcher. But now we uh, we move uh, forward to the next step, it means implementation, and here we see the bottoms. The next slide, please. The key element in the implementation of advanced NBS should be the involvement of stakeholders at local, regional, and national level. They should be involved in the initial stage of all projects, from co-assessment through co-planning and co-design to co-implementation. This co-creation process allows us to identify gaps and opportunity. I will say during, uh, during opening session of conference, we need to listen. And next, please. Uh, our 15 years experience in collaboration with stakeholders show that in order to empower bottom-up initiatives, it's necessary to create, give them some kind of formal structure. For example, in Poland, the Minister of Agriculture has launched the Local Water Partnership Program. This is a great idea for local water management in agriculture area. However, one of the conclusions of this partnership creation workshops is that we need local leaders. So that final element is education, especially the young leaders involving the new generation is one of the opportunity to achieve the goals of 
sustain of European Green Deal and sustainable mm -hmm. development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All the speakers and I invite all the panelists and all the presenters to submit uh, to the journal Ecohydrology Hydrology the papers when you explain more your points. And in this moment we'll have really important document which is summarizing our brainstorming today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Quite a one word to uh, the finish of this conference. Uh, how to sum up by one, one words? We have to continue. Thank you very much.